BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. So, Amit, what are we looking at here? OK, we're watching a video clip of a woman. She's waking up from what looks like a very, very deep sleep. And now she's walking across the room in her underwear, except the room has now turned into a misty forest. Charlotte, I really do not know why you're showing me this. <laughs> OK, great. Right, this next one. What, what do you see? OK, I see one of the actors who's played Batman throwing his fists around. It looks like he's in a boxing match. And Oh, no, hang on, wait. The boxing match is now morphing into a passionate interpretive dance scene. Perfect. OK, last one. OK, so we're in space. We can see Earth rising against the black background. This looks like a David Attenborough film. We're seeing shots of the Barrier Reef. Now we're in an alpine forest. A wild bee collects pollen and a perfume bottle washes up on a bed of flowers. Aha! Uh-huh. This week on All Consuming, we're making sense of the perfume industry. I'm smelling a story. Oh dear. Perfume is like a drug. It's very manipulative and it's powerful. I see perfume as an industrial product. To me, it's like wine or beer. It's effectively a method of making ourselves more attractive. Welcome to All Consuming with me, Amit Katwala. And me, Charlotte Williams. I'm an entrepreneur and marketing expert. Amit is a science journalist and author. And in this series, we explore our culture of consumption through products that have changed the world. We'll unravel the mysteries of marketing and the formidable forces that drive purchasing habits, while looking to the past to see how these landmark products have shifted the course of history. So, Amit, welcome to the very first episode of All Consuming. Thanks, Charlotte. It's great to be here. We've got such an exciting series ahead of us. Over the next few weeks, we'll be sculling non-alcoholic drinks, diving into the weird and wonderful world of virtual reality, and spinning vinyl like it's going out of style. All of that and much more to come. So, Charlotte, what did you just put me through? Well, I don't know if I put you through anything, but we just watched the wonderful world of perfume advertising. Did you not love it? It was certainly very eclectic. There was a really kind of broad mix of styles. We had uh, some very kind of James Bond influenced stuff, yeah. white sheets and all that kind of stuff. And then we had Robert Pattinson doing his weird shadow boxing thing. <laughs> I feel like this topic might be something that you know slightly more about than me. So you're not a perfume wearer? No, I'm more of a uh, supermarket two for three pounds deodorant kind of guy. <laughs> Interesting. So yeah, I do know a lot about perfume. I do own a lot of perfumes, but I actually don't wear too many. Do you associate the products that you own with the different advertisements that you've seen? Like, do you choose a different perfume based on the marketing or the smell? How do you choose? I personally don't, but I'm a marketer, yeah. so I just go on smell and, and memory. So, Charlotte, one of the things I do know is that human design smells are everywhere. They're in shampoos, they're in washing powder, they're in candles and deodorants. They might get wafted out in a high-end shop or sprayed to cover up some of our more slightly um, unpleasant odours. <laughs> You're right, but perfumes aspire to be a little bit more artistic than perhaps your can of air freshener does, specifically designed to elicit emotions within the wearer and those around them. I guess it's a bit like choosing an outfit. You want to pick something that's going to send off the right vibes, I suppose. But it could be more personal. Your perfume might hint that you're, I don't know, adventurous or intellectual or maybe something a little spicier. To kick us off, let's meet someone who takes this idea of evoking character through a faction, that's science speak for smell, by the way, to a whole other level. The doors open and I'm struck by an overwhelming fragrance. Rich mahogany, spicy cinnamon and something sweeter. Maybe rose? The perfume intensifies as we move through the building. It's enchanting, sensual, maybe even a little bit risque. Hundreds of tiny vials adorn the walls of the humble office. And in a corner, boxes are piled high and they're labelled Orlando, Johnny, Helena. Perfume is like a drug. It's something that you just get addicted to. I'm visiting Azzy Glass's studio in North London. I'd never thought there was much of a role for a perfumer on a film set. But for the last 15 years, Azzy has been helping transform actors into characters with her bespoke fragrances. Actors come to me and I create a scent that will get them into the character. Smell is very manipulative and it's powerful. So when you're on set, it's very, very effective. Her clients include Orlando Bloom, Helena Bonham Carter and Jude Law. 
Let me show you one what he did when Johnny Depp played Mad Hatter in Alice 2. With the role of Mad Hatter, he's always like laughing and he's smiling constantly. I thought, well, okay, I'm going to do a fragrance that is going to, when he smells it, immediately make him smile. I wanted to kind of recreate exactly the sort of smell of grandma's Victoria sponge cakes, yeah. lemon drizzle, high tea, that magical fantasy yeah. tea party that everyone wants to have. This literally smells like a lemon drizzle cake. Yeah. And then you go deeper in and it starts getting warmer, like that buttery sponge mm. note. It smells like you could eat it. It smells mm. like if I licked this, there'd be some like cream yeah. on my tongue. She's smiling as well. Yeah, I'm smiling. <laughs> oh my God. I love this. I want to smell like this. My first actress I worked with was Helena Bonham Carter. And one of the roles that she played was Miss Havisham in Great Expectations. She was dumped at the altar. She's still got the wedding dress on years and years following that. And she doesn't leave the house. So you're going to smell this now. So this smells exactly how you just described. You're on the bus and you like have to sit next to an old lady. It smells like she's washed with a flannel, you know, with it's pink yeah. little bit of soap in the bathroom. Yeah. Wowza. As he has gone on to craft bespoke personal fragrances for some of these actors. Let's do Helena's actual bespoke. One of the biggest things that I wanted to get through, which I think not everyone always sees, is the fact that she has this kind of real haute couture presence about mm. her. Especially she's like the queen of all of our actresses. And she's so funny and beautiful. And her styling and dress sense is just very unique and original. It's eccentric. It smells very expensive. This smells actually what I'd imagine royalty to smell like. It's sweet. Mm. There is a slight warmth to it. Yeah. It's like you could give her a hug. I live near a really old English sweet shop, one of the long-standing traditional sweet shops that still exist, and it sells candied fruits and sweets, and mm. she smells like this, a candied <laughs> sweet shop, but also mm. she's the queen. <laughs> OK, so of course not everyone can afford to have their own fragrance design, but the industry as a whole is huge. So just to drop some stats on you, Charlotte, globally the perfume industry is worth more than £40 billion annually. Here in the UK, we spend more than £1.5 billion on perfume every year. Wow. Fragrances marketed towards women take roughly 93% of the market. An estimated 8.3 million women in the UK use fragrance every single day. Another 4.5 million women say they use perfume two or three times a week. And since the pandemic, the industry has also experienced a shift in purchasing trends. Online sales have rocketed, and, like so many things post-pandemic, they're unlikely to return to quote-unquote normal. So, as we've touched on, one of the most consistent themes in perfume marketing is the product itself. You've got to have a really recognisable brand and a really recognisable bottle. And this isn't a new trend. People have been using perfume materials for millennia. Luca Turin is a biophysicist and author with an interest in the science of smell and the history of the perfume industry. In the various archaeological digs in Egypt, they found recipes for perfumes. There are even little uh, vessels containing perfume that, I am told, still smell good. And in fact, there's a um, legendary a fragrance which I believe was worn by Cleopatra. And again, I haven't smelt them, but I'm told it brings bad luck, so I'm not complaining. Some of today's most common fragrance materials were initially used as bug repellents, like patchouli, a species of flowering plant native to Southeast Asia. Patchouli in India was used to prevent uh, moths from eating silk, and so the silk bales sent to Europe were surrounded by patchouli leaves, and I think what happened was the people who got the silk bales said, hey, that smells great, can we have more? While natural ingredients like patchouli remain in common use today, a series of accidental discoveries kick-started a revolution in perfumery. Modern perfumery started at the end of the 19th century. There had been a lot of progress before that on the extraction of raw materials from, from plants, but all this changed drastically in the 1870s and early 1880s when chemists started making things, uh, new compounds by the hundreds. Chemists who were trying to synthesize molecules would come across interesting smells and when they had some sense uh, instead of saying oh well it's only a smell you know they founded a, a business on it uh, William Perkin the guy who discovered the first uh, reliable purple dye the famous mauve he went on to synthesize uh, coumarin which is a very important fragrance material and I believe he made a 
ton of money from it. Another milestone discovery by German chemist Albert Bauer was happened upon while trying to synthesize a better TNT. In the 1870s and 1880s, enterprising industrial chemists were exploring all manner of variations of TNT in the hope of finding something which might be a better, stronger explosive or safer to carry or something that didn't sort of blow up when you kicked it. In the course of making variations on TNT, he came across this material which, from what I understand, was an absolutely lousy explosive, but it smelled fantastic. Being a smart dude, he said, okay, forget explosives, let's make fragrances. And he started actually marketing that molecule as musk bauer. Traditionally, musk had been collected from secretions of a gland from inside the musk deer in an expensive and frankly quite unethical process. So swapping to a synthetic musk was an obvious choice. But the perfume revolution was only just beginning. Natural materials are, as their name indicates, essentially isolated from usually plants that produce typically a complex uh, spectrum of molecules. And so the idea is, as much as is possible, to extract the smell from the plant without damaging it, which is actually non-trivial because you, more frequently than not, you have to heat things up to get the smell out. You have to use solvents. So natural materials are typically expensive because the yield is low, right? You take a ton of roses, you get one kilo of oil and they're extremely complex. I mean, rose oil contains maybe 800 something, a thousand different molecules and not all contribute noticeably to the, to the final smell. By contrast, aroma chemicals, as they're known, or odorants or synthetic materials, they are made by chemists. They're frequently pure. They are, by comparison with natural materials, dirt cheap. You can see how this would be attractive to an industrialist. Synthetic ingredients birthed a renaissance in the perfume industry, a new era of novel fragrances, accessibility and entrepreneurship. Synthesis of new synthetic raw materials enabled modern perfumery because it enabled you to make a perfume which had let's say a few strong and clear and pure aroma chemicals in it to give you the structure and then you would add naturals to flesh it out in early 20th century france a young upstart named francois Coty was about to revolutionize perfumery his concept was this you have a product which is both luxurious and not wildly expensive he believed that if you made a really good perfume and you packaged it in a beautiful bottle, you could really make something which everybody would buy. And pretty soon his company called Coty became an absolutely huge thing. It had factories in like 10 different countries. Coty was at one point the richest man in France. Each one of the fragrances that he invented during the early years started a trend all of its own. It started like hundreds of imitations. So he essentially mapped out modern perfumery. He drifted into being a press baron. The newspapers he bought were ultra right wing, uh, xenophobic and fascist uh, outfits. And he uh, essentially died a recluse uh, in the mid 1930s. <laughs> so that story took a slight turn, but Coty's fragrance empire is certainly sounding a lot like the perfume business that we're seeing today. Yeah, I mean, hopefully with maybe a little less of this alt right ethos and unhappy ending indeed, but this focus on beautiful, recognisable packaging and the affordable price point is very much holding true with the perfume industry that we know today. Mm. Now let's turn to the psychology of perfume. What's actually happening when we smell? Hmm. Our sense of smell is actually involved in every aspect of our lives from our emotions, our memories, our social relationships, our sense of self, our connectedness to the world around us. I could go on, but the way that the sense of smell works is it is a chemical sense detector. Rachel Herz is a neuroscientist and an expert in the psychological science of smell. The way I look at perfume is actually the way I look at fashion. It is a way of adorning oneself and a way of making a statement about oneself, as well as a way of covering up what you don't want other people to see. And it's effectively a method of making ourselves more attractive. Our emotional responses to aromas are more nuanced than simply liking or disliking a fragrance. I could say I, I actually really like this fragrance and so that in and of itself puts me in a good mood. Then I could be smelling the fragrance that you specifically are wearing. And if I think that it fits you, that's going to augment it even further. 
and we like to have things be congruent. So if you're a man and you're wearing, let me take a more extreme example, Chanel number no. five, although I may really like Chanel number no. five, the fact that this is incongruent with being a man may make me feel a little uncertain about you in a way that wouldn't be good, let's just say. Whereas if you were wearing a masculine fragrance, and I liked it, that would actually have a very positive augmenting effect on my perception of you. But that's just based on how I've learned the meaning of these fragrances. And the meaning is totally arbitrary. Rachel says this idea of congruence also extends to perfume marketing. One of the many really interesting things about smell is that scents are invisible. It is true, vision is the primary sense, I have to admit. At least from the point of view of data collection and figuring out what is going on in the world around us. So. A smell is invisible, I then present it to you in a very vivid visual kind of way. And as a function of the visuals I'm presenting, I can create the connotation, I can create the meaning of what this scent is. In an experiment testing this theory, Rachel measured people's responses to ambiguous odours. I had a, a scent concoction, and I said to someone, this is Parmesan cheese. And the person smelled it and it, oh yes, it is Parmesan cheese, and I say, rate it for how pleasant it is. Oh, it's extremely pleasant. What would you do? I would eat it. And then at another session, abracadabra, I present you with the exact same chemical mixture. And this time I say, it's vomit. And you say, oh my God, disgusting. So our capability of being manipulated by language when it comes to scent is tremendous. And that's because we believe our eyes and our ears way more than we believe our noses. Rachel says that in humans and other mammals, females have an innate ability to detect genes in potential partners. A reproductive instinct evolved to help choose appropriate mates. The way that this works is that females should be looking for men whose immune system genes are complementary to her own, such that the child that they may have will be most successful and healthy. So it turns out that the body odor of men is an extremely important signal for sexual attraction or not sexual attraction for women. Interestingly, this innate ability may actually be compromised by wearing perfumes or deodorants. Wearing of fine fragrance, body sprays, you know, all the personal products that we use which have fragrance in them can mask our natural body odor and they can also in and of themselves be really appealing. So if I smell a guy who's got great fragrance on and I'm very attracted to that and I cannot actually smell the underlying real genetics body odor, then I may enter into a relationship with someone who is actually not going to end up being the best person for me or him as well from the point of view of having a child that lives to survive and thrive and so on. So it really feels like by you not wearing cologne, you're really trying to push these pheromones out to your to your wife to be like, you know, this is me. I would like to clarify that I do I do wear deodorant. I'm not just wandering yeah, around yeah. in a sort of miasma of kind of body odour. <laughs> but it's a really interesting thought that we might be working our, against our own best interests by covering up the information our body's sharing with the world with, you know, artificial deodorants or perfumes. So Rachel stresses that this theory applies mainly to heterosexual relationships, given the foundations of being tied to reproductive instinct, but the elements may still be applicable more broadly. Yeah, I think attraction is also to do with desire, though, regardless of the end result, whether or not you're going to produce a child. So let's turn to the attraction factories then and find out where <laughs> perfumes are designed on a mass scale. In small firms, people sit in front of a, a perfumer's organ, as it's called, with all these little bottles, and they weigh the things in a milligram balance in front of them. In the big perfumery firms, the perfumers have a computer at which they sit, writing the formula on the computer. Computer calculates the cost. When you're pleased with the formula and the cost, you hit the return button and the message gets sent down to a robot on the ground floor, which is a machine in a room that contains maybe two or three thousand bottles of aroma chemicals. And the machine then goes through each bottle, picks out the amount required, and then puts a label on it and it gets sent back to your office and then you can smell it and, and test it. Once the composition arrives, the fragrance goes through an editing process. Typically, perfumers, just like writers, need an editor. The evaluators track the progress of the composition and tell you a bit more of this, a bit less of that, and so on. 
Sometimes the big manufacturers don't necessarily want something quite so original. Inspiration is at the core of all progress in art. One of the big problems with, if you want imitation in perfumery, is that the industry is chasing its own tail endlessly. And indeed, every great success generates a hundred versions of itself. Uh, and that's 90%, if you want, of mass fine fragrances, just imitating each other. Once in a while, you get a completely new idea, a composition that blows everybody's mind, and then, boom, another hundred imitations an hour. What Luca was saying here has really reminded me of something I saw a lot over lockdown, which was cheaper versions of perfumes that are being sold via social media. I must admit, this completely passed me by during lockdown. So how did it work exactly? So on TikTok quite heavily, I saw lots of videos that were promoting perfumes that were just numbers. So the bottle was just like a plain bottle and then it had just a number on it. So it was like number 17. And then an influencer would come on to the screen and then talk about how it smells like, insert perfume name. And it's basically just a perfume that's been created exactly the same as... I don't know, Chanel number no. 5 or whatever, but um, with cheaper ingredients and sold at a cheaper price point without the, the branding. So it kind of reminds me of how you can get paints mixed up. So if you want a particular colour that's only made by a certain manufacturer mm. and it's too expensive, you can kind of take a sample of it to the hardware store and get them to colour match it to make something that's kind of almost exactly the same but not quite the same. If you want to get it exactly right, you need to analyse it with the gas chromatograph. The gas chromatograph separates the fragrance into each of its component molecules and then tells you the relative amount of each. But it's not that simple. The people who use a lot of natural materials, they're very high quality firms, what they try and do is they ensure a unique and exclusive supply of a particular thing. Or even going further, they buy the company that makes the thing. So no one else can get their filthy hands on that particular grade of something or other. Now let's turn to the future of fragrance. As our society evolves, so too will our perfumes. I definitely think that as a function of this more non-binary period that we're in, that fragrances will follow that trend, just like other aspects of fashion and other aspects of self-expression. For younger people who don't have a strong association grounded in specific fragrance categories, it would be a lot easier for them to be able to accept the sort of non-gendered kind of scent as being totally appropriate for a man or a woman, or a they or whomever the person feels they are. I think there may be something in the future to do with adjustable fragrance. So you have a composition which is somehow computer controlled and changes slightly. And there's also plenty of scope for chemistry. I mean, the great companies and even some smaller ones are still discovering amazing molecules. That's part of the great excitement of modern perfumery is that the chemists will come up with something literally you've never smelled before. That's such a fascinating idea, isn't it? It's almost like coming up with a new colour or something, the idea that a new smell could just be discovered. We just assume we know everything about everything. So to think that there's something we haven't smelt, tasted or seen in the world, it's kind of mind-blowing. I guess the assumption that these people make are that these things are going to smell good, but what if you invented something that was, like, so foul-smelling that it, you know, levelled cities? <laughs> and with that, that's all we have time for. <laughs> Join us next time on All Consuming, where we won't be getting our buzz on as we sample some of the finest non-alcoholic products that are out there. All Consuming is hosted by Charlotte Williams and by me, Amit Katwala. Big thanks to our guests, Luca Turin, Rachel Hers, and Azzy Glasser. This episode was produced by James Tyndale, the executive producer was Will Yates, and All Consuming is a Whistledown production for BBC Radio 4. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you soon. See you next time. I'm Gus Casely Hayford. As a historian, I love to unpick the hidden histories behind what we wear. In my series, Torn, for BBC Radio 4, we hear about the fashion items that have changed the world. From the humble tote bag... I have a textile dating from late 17th century, and it is quite like a modern tote bag with a beautiful pattern of crisscross and flowers and just two elongated handles. To the miniskirt. There were other possibilities in the air, and the miniskirt was the beginning of saying, we are somebody different. That's Torn from BBC Radio 4. Listen to stories that are woven into the fashion items in your wardrobe. Subscribe now on BBC Sounds.